All right, so we're good. Okay. All right. Let's see how this goes. Um, you don't know me. I'm Jason. I'm this year's chassis lead. Uh, thanks for coming out. Hopefully, you'll learn something. Uh, let's try to just hop into it. A uh, little overview here. Uh, we're going to talk about the chassis team, um, <laughs> what they, what we do, um, what a chassis is, um, sort of the different options that we have going over that, um, the dynamics of chassis, which is a little interesting, uh, structures and validation. Start off with the team. Uh, as a photo from the one of the layups that we did last year. Um, sadly, some of these people are no longer with us. Uh, that's what you're here for. All right, what does Chassis do? Uh, we are responsible for integrating every system that has to go on the car together uh, while meeting rules and every need for every system. Uh, this is kind of a photo that shows bare bones. Um, strictly chassis nothing else is there uh, and then you can see over here we have every system integrated on the car um, nice big happy family um, we'll get more into detail in a minute overview of the system uh, this is a steel frame from 2020 uh, just for some context there all right, so the chassis, again, connects every system together and is also responsible for transferring lateral loads uh, from things like the wheels and stuff like that. This is a, a fun photo that I like. Um, you can see you got some loading uh, laterally and that sort of uh, you know, loads on different sides of the car show up. You can see the twisting of the frame uh, in the truck there. Uh, we'll get more into that later, but that's what you don't want to happen. Um, that kind of shows you what lateral loading uh, we're mostly worried about. There are a few different types of chassis uh, you can kind of choose from. Uh, we have space frames like that other one I was showing you from 2020, uh, monocoques, ladders, and a few more. But for our competition, we more or less have two options. Uh, steel space frames and monocoques. They're pretty much the most efficient way to have strength and stiffness while also uh, integrating everything together. Uh, F1 cars use monocoques. Um, pretty cool. And what you'll see soon is that we transferred from a steel space frame to a monocoque for the very first time last year. Uh, so this is what we're dealing with right now. Uh, it's kind of, you know, talked about as a two thirds monocoque where the front box and the cockpit are carbon fiber, one giant piece, and the rear box is still uh, steel space frame. Um, anyone have any idea as to why we chose to have steel space frame rear box? Um, so there are resin systems uh, like the one here that are heat resistant, um, but it can help with cooling because everything is nice and open. Um, that's not the biggest reason as to why we did it. Any other guesses? Um, we'll get a little bit more into it later, but manufacturing a monocoque is arguably less time. Um, but uh, Properties of composites are highly dependent on the skills of the manufacturer. So it could be if we had no a very little skill, which we did last year, uh, that we did it for that reason. But that's not the biggest reason. You have one? So that's the biggest reason uh, that we still have a steel space frame rear box is that serviceability and accessibility for a lot of the systems that are back there is much easier um, than, you know, 
having everything in a giant box. Uh, we do have a couple of holes in there for accessibility. Um, but for things like the engine, I think pretty much any powertrain engineer would kill us <laughs> if it was a full monocoque. Um, but that's something to consider for EV, uh, which we're going to be doing pretty soon, whether or not that serviceability is going to be required. Uh, another thing that we're responsible for is something called the impact attenuator. Does anyone know what that means? Okay, who hasn't seen one of these? So you kind of know what an impact attenuator is. Basically, if you're going down the highway and you're going to run off the road and run into something, you don't want it to be nice and hard, stiff, and keep you from they keep you from surviving, you know. Uh, but this sort of slows down the acceleration, uh, so you know stopping fast doesn't kill you. We have the same thing, um, but it's attached to the car rather than the road. Uh, this is kind of a few examples here on the right. Um, it just attaches to the front of the car, uh, just in case you hit something, it slows down the impact. Uh, it's a project for someone, if anyone's interested, to look into that for us. Uh, dynamics. So there are a bunch of load cases on our big box. Uh, the main one that we are concerned with is twisting or torsion. Uh, as you can see in figure one right there. Uh, basically, that's the twisting of the chassis uh, longitudinally between the front and the rear axles. Um, talk a little bit more about that and why it matters. Uh, torsional stiffness affects the kinematics of the car. Um, most cars are designed around suspension. Um, that's generally the best way to design a car. You start with suspension and then it goes off the chassis. And then every other system engineer kind of just decides where it goes on the chassis. And, you know, like chassis can kind of make changes if they're nice um, to accommodate other systems. But generally, suspension goes first, then chassis, and then from there on. So, a uh, big thing is like knowing where your wheels are and being able to predict the uh, suspension behavior. So, if you don't have stiffness in torsion, you could hit a bump or something, and then your car is like this. You don't really know, like it, it doesn't make sense for your wheel to be this high up on this side and this on this quarter. So handling uh, is pretty proportional to torsional stiffness. Um, it's nice to know where your wheels are and how they're going to affect, uh, how they're going to be affected by bumps in the road and, and cornering and things like that. Um, has to do a lot with lateral load transfer distribution between the front and rear axles. Um, if you're braking and turning left, for example, you're going to have a lot of load on that front right corner. Uh, if you can distribute that load between the front right corner and the rear right corner, things are going to be a lot better for you. You're not going to overload one corner of the car. Um, you're more likely to stay in control. Uh, a little bit more about it. If you think about it, anything is a spring. Um, and when you put a spring in between two other springs, you get more spring. Uh, you don't want that. You want the only springs on the car to be from suspension. That way they're acting the way they're designed to act. Um, but unless you have an infinitely stiff chassis, there's always gonna be a spring connecting the other two in series. Um, ideally, it is infinitely rigid, but that's not how physics works. Uh, so we get it to a certain point to where the uh, returns start, you know, diminish. Um, it's hard to quantify. So if someone is able to do that, that'd be very helpful for the team. Um, but we're pretty solid right now with what we have, the platform that we're working with. Um, so suspension is very happy. Design, this is like sort of a loose rundown of how you go about designing a frame or chassis. Uh, you figure out which loads matter, uh, which loads there are. You gotta figure out what you're gonna see in dynamic uh, you know, settings, you're running the car, acceleration, deceleration, cornering, um, 
figuring out what stiffnesses you want, which like I said, is pretty difficult to do sometimes. Uh, one of the biggest ones is figuring out what kind of frame you want to use and figuring out what, what materials you're going to need to make that happen. And then if you have the time and you feel confident in it, you can model the frame and figure out if it's actually going to do what you want it to do. Uh, and then what I enjoy doing is physically validating stiffness and how, how the frame uh, reacts to different loaded, loading cases. And there's lastly, analyzing on track performance, mostly looking at suspension data uh, to try to figure out how that load distribution is working. So like I mentioned a little bit earlier, last year we finally made the transition from a steel space frame to a carbon fiber monocoque. Um, the carbon fiber that I'm working with right now is not plotted on this graph, but if it were, it would be about right here. So a nice little medium between spe uh, specific strength and specific modulus. Uh, you can look at different steels and different fibers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, just super stiff for its density. Um, like I said, composites have a higher specific uh, strength and stiffness than something like steel. Uh, they, there are some co uh, complications that you have to deal with when manufacturing with composites that you wouldn't have to uh, deal with when manufacturing with something like steel. Um, but theoretically, it takes less time to manufacture. Um, you're not having to weld a billion different tubes together and very precise orientations and everything like that. Uh, you just, you're making one big part. Another giant uh, pro for a monocoque is that you can essentially have suspension mount wherever they want to. Um, Back in our steel space frames, everything was very limited for suspension because you have to mount at nodes, which is basically where a bunch of tubes just come together at the same point. Uh, but with this, you can mount anywhere. You basically just have a giant rectangle, free blank canvas for, for suspension. So when you decide you wanna use composites, uh, there are a few things that you wanna to try to do before you really make your whole part. Uh, the first one is testing the material itself. Uh, the way we do that is uh, with tensile coupons. and We validate the tensile strength and stiffness of the material that we have. Uh, once you do that, figure out how strong and stiff it is. We can make uh, non-specific elements like panels that we can pull on or push on or bend or whatever. Um, to sort of get an idea as to how, how it actually works in a structure. Um, then you can start to get into actual components and putting everything together and having your full system. So there are a bunch of different loads on the car from a bunch of different things. Uh, the biggest one I think is uh, from suspension, just because you know suspension is what connects the car to the ground. Uh, if you can't transfer the loads that the suspension sees, you're not gonna have a very easily controllable car. Um, yeah, it'd be like riding on a spring if you don't have a good understanding of loads and uh, stiffness and stuff like that. So finally, there's validation. Uh, you can do that in a couple of ways. First one is modeling and simulation, uh, finite, uh, finite element analysis. Um, ideally, this will give you a good base, uh, baseline of how things are gonna work. Uh, whether or not things are going to break, be able to extend the loads that you're going to that it's going to see. Um, but ultimately, doesn't really mean anything uh, without physical testing. So, this is last year's uh, car F21, and we uh, at the very beginning of this semester did torsional stiffness testing on it over in the civil engineering lab, uh, the pit. Uh, basically, how we do this is we constrain the car at the rear hubs and we replace all of the dampers and springs with solid uh, pieces so that the whole uh, suspension system basically doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then we uh, attach the front two hubs together with this bar. Then we have a lever arm that we add weights to 
and we measure on the underside of the monocoque um, easier than a steel space frame because it's nice and flat. Uh, the displacement for different torques. And from that, we can get a torsional stiffness value that can either agree with or not agree with our finite element models. Um, so yeah, basically finite element model, hard to make without actually testing what you actually, you know, what's physically there. Uh, simulations in real life are a little different. Um, yeah, that's definitely one of the most important things that we can do, do for this car is build it and then test it physically. And that is about all I have for you. Um, you have any questions? Let me know. So from space frame to monocoque, we saved about zero pounds. Okay. However, the torsional stiffness increased by about 90%. Um, so what we're gonna focus on this year is reducing weight while maintaining a high torsional stiffness. And the, the carbon fiber that I'm working with right now uh, has a uh, specific modulus and specific strength of about 150% of what we used last year. Um, so we, we have the material. We just got to figure out how to use it and use it effectively. That's one of the giant, um, I guess, pros about using composites is you can you know, have the same strength and stiffness while drastically reducing weight. Um, anything else? So Jack asked about uh, fiber directions in the car. Um, so fibers are strong in tension and not strong in compression and kind of strong in shear. If you think about a rope, if you pull on a rope, it's nice and strong. As soon as you start to push it together, it falls apart. Um, so the way you kind of get around that is you have fibers going in different directions. So say uh, you want it to be about the same in every direction uh, in, in a plane, uh, you could have fibers going this way and also fibers going this way. And if you wanna make it what's called quasi isotropic, so almost the same in every direction, you can add more directions like this and like that. Um, and then you al almost have the same tensile properties in every direction. Um, that's why a lot of the carbon fiber that you see uh, looks like it's woven together, right? It's it's. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not going to even try to draw that, but basically, I guess I'm going to try to draw that. Uh, yeah, so they're all woven together, you know, interlocking. Um, there are benefits to that. Um, it kind of simplifies everything. Uh, you already know you're going to have pretty good strength in at least two directions. Um, but if you think about it, there's a lot of, I guess, inefficiencies there where there you have a lot of physical voids in between the fibers because if you think about it none of them are perfectly straight you got stuff like this going on uh so there are a bunch of gaps that just get completely filled with resin um i don't want to get like too deep into composites unless you guys want me to um but basically uh the stuff that we're using well the stuff that you see here and on almost every carbon fiber part you've probably ever seen in your life is that woven fabric sort of thing. Uh, so it's like taking threads and weaving them together. Uh, the stuff that we're trying to use this year looks more like that. So we don't have that weave anymore. It's all uh, in the same direction. Um, I'm sure you can probably figure out uh, common sense wise why that's a little bit more beneficial. Um, but I'll explain it anyway. All of those voids where the fibers are not uh, perfectly flat that would normally just be filled with resin um, are no longer there. So you only have as much resin as you need to uh, surround the fibers themselves. Um, 
also their every load that goes through them is going to be totally uh uh axial so there's no like pulling on a fiber that looks like this uh it's all this way which is exactly where they're strong in so that's why you can get like higher specific strengths and stiffnesses um, with unidirectional fibers rather than woven fibers. Um, yeah, I imagine that answered your question, kind of. We're not gonna have only fibers going in one direction on the car. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, the loads for the chassis are not all the same everywhere. There are a bunch of different loads going on everywhere from aero to suspension to the driver sitting it to, you know, you name it. It's got to be another question somewhere about anything. The angle of the core. Right here. Well, um, the core itself is only there. So if you don't know, the way a lot of structural composites work is you have what's called a sandwich panel, where you have a skin of carbon fiber on top, and then you have some sort of core material in the, in the middle. Maybe that's not the best way to draw it because it kind of looks like fibers. Um, and then there's another sandwich or another skin on, on the bottom. Uh, this is the core that he's talking about in the middle here. The core is only there to do one thing. Uh, does anyone have any idea as to what that is? Anti smush. Anti -smush? <laughs> well, the core that we use is. Uh, aluminum honeycomb it's super low density uh, it's not particularly strong in compression um, the walls of these of these honeycomb uh, cells are like so like this thickness is uh, seven ten thousandths of an inch so there's almost nothing there besides a little bit of aluminum uh, if you've taken mechanics and materials, uh, if you haven't, that's okay. Um, but basically, the core is there to increase the distance from the neutral axis of the core uh, that the carbon fiber is. So, like this distance here, I guess it's right there. Um, I'm trying to think of an example here that you guys have probably seen before. Um, so if you take a piece of paper, super thin, you try to bend it, it bends nice and easily. But if you take a ream of paper, you know, 400 pieces of paper thick or whatever, and you hold it down real hard so they can't slide with respect to each other, and you try to bend it, it's a lot more difficult, right? Because you have all that material uh, far away from the bending axis. That's exactly what the core is doing. So instead of having solid carbon fiber all the way that thickness, you just have this core spacer that gets that carbon fiber further away uh, from the, yeah, the, the axis of bending. Um, it increases the uh, area moment of inertia, basically, or the I, if you know that uh, parameter. Uh, so that's, what's core, that's what core is used for. Um, that's pretty much like that's that's why we still have a top to this essentially. Uh, if you didn't have one, your I guess polar moment of inertia would go way down, which is basically just based on the cross sectional area going this way. Um, so like if you cut the front of the car off and looked at it, uh, that's the area I'm talking about. Uh, if you got rid of this whole top here, you'd miss out on a lot of that. And that's far away from the twisting axis. Um, yeah. So I, I want to say you want to get as close to a circle as possible, more or less. Um, 
but sometimes angles are easier to deal with, especially with the kind of core that we had. Uh, it doesn't like to conform too well to round surfaces. So basically how we just ended up doing it is we cut out different sections of core for different faces. Um, yeah, there are, there are different types of core material that can form to curves a little bit better, but they're super expensive. Um, the core that we use is arguably out of our budget anyway. So going more, you know, further uh, than that is a little bit uh, out of the picture. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, you can ask me about it more. So he says, he asks uh, basically how we attach the skins to the core, right? Oh, okay. So we have, uh, he, he's asking how we um, join the pieces of core that we cut out individually for each face. And that's basically just, um, well, it's a core splice adhesive. So it's something that you put inside of the layup. And then when it gets uh, cured at an elevated temperature, it expands and gets all sticky. And it basically just joins the two pieces together. Ideally, you don't have that because it weighs a lot. Um, well, it weighs a lot more than if there was nothing there. Um, but like I said, we just don't really have the budget, maybe, uh, for going far beyond the, the core that we have right now. There are some teams that are restricted to using like foam and there are a couple of teams, at least there were in the past that used balsa wood as core. Um, it does the same thing. It doesn't really need to be too strong. Uh, if there's a picture in here somewhere. Getting there. Okay. So per rules, we have to have either two or three brackets on each side that join the two together. Uh, we went with three. It looks good. Also, it's a little safer. There's a little uh, less testing that we have to do in order to use three. Um, that's basically it. There are through holes um, on each side. Uh, as far as mounting anything to the monocoque, we have these. Um, different kinds of inserts. Um, a lot of them are just through the thickness of the whole panel uh, inserts that are cylindrical. And you drill the hole out, you pot them in, uh, you know, they're bonded in there. They have a nice like nominal bolt size hole uh, that goes all the way through and you positively lock it on the, on the other side of the chassis. Um, for things that aren't so critical, we do the same sort of thing, but we just thread the insides and you can just screw whatever you need to screw in in there. Nothing else. Uh, I want to say it was about 50 50 between. Wait, what, what was your question again? I want to make sure I missed. Um, it depends on where it is. Uh, different areas of the monocoque are regulated differently. Um, so there are some places where you need more carbon uh, than you do core. In some places where more core makes more sense than carbon. Uh, there's a little bit of a gray area as to trying to determine whether or not to add more carbon or to increase the thickness of your core. Um, but generally, if you can increase the thickness of your core, you should, uh, because the density of the core is much lower than that of the carbon fiber. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. So I don't have an exact number for you. So we still have inserts. So like if you have, maybe it makes sense to draw this out. Um, so let's say like this is your panel. And you want to mount, uh, let's do the rear box. Let's just say we're going to put the rear box on there. Um, 
you essentially have that. And then these holes, these inner diameter uh, through holes, you can just uh, shove a bolt through. Those are critical like things, you know, they see a lot of load. Uh, it wouldn't be wise to just thread a bolt into there. Uh, for something like the, I don't know, mounting the uh, ECU or something like that to the chassis, you can just have the same sort of thing where it's like, it's still a cylindrical insert that goes through the, um, like the, you know, the thickness of the monocoque. Um, but instead of having a through hole that goes like that and you, uh, you know, feed a, a bolt all the way through, you just have threads on the inside here. And then you can just screw something in there. Like if you're mounting something that's not too heavy or doesn't see any loads or something like that. Um, yeah, so, you know, small things on the inside, like mounting the fuel tank and whatnot. So I uh, kind of, I think I might've mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, but basically I guess to go like break it all the way down to the very bottom, a composite is basically, well, these the composites we're working with here are fibers and then a matrix, uh, which is like a resin, epoxy resin, something like that. Um, there are resin systems that are heat resistant. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that is, but there are plenty that are. Um, there are some that aren't and have a, a low uh, like yield temperature, I guess, if that's a, if that's a term. Um, but if we were to do a full monocoque where we have the engine mounted uh, and surrounded by a composite, there are resin systems that are uh, able to do that. And you basically have to worry about the, the resin heating up and catching on fire or losing strength or something like that. The carbon fibers themselves, they're fine. So right here, um, the exhaust, they're not in the model here, but the exhaust runners come out right here. That's what always wants to space is for that is you know, exhaust tubes. And just warming up in the shop, uh, we were using an infrared thermometer right here on this heat shield right here. You can't see it, um, but it's, it's, it's right here. And it was getting up to about 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so pretty toasty. A um, little unfortunate because that's where we're planning on mounting a few things, but or hoping to be able to mount a few things. It gets pretty toasty, especially when you're driving it for, you know, half an hour at full throttle. Any other questions? I had to walk through a maze to get here. Can I turn this off? Hello. Anything else? Nothing. Uh, however long it's allowed to be. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a number for you. Uh, that's pretty much determined by um, suspension geometry, though. Also determined by suspension geometry. It's wide enough for a person to fit in it. Ideally, they're both done at the same time. Um, whatever happens, happens. Last year, we went and basically made this thing from scratch in about a month. Ideally, that doesn't happen this season. Um, you get a much higher quality part, the uh, slower you take it. Uh, like I said, 
working with composites is totally different than working with isotropic materials like steel, aluminum, you know, you name it, normal materials. Uh, it depends a lot on the manufacturing quality. Um, so yeah, hopefully we, we get to spend a little bit more time manufacturing the monocoque this year than we did last year. But ideally, the entire chassis is uh, ready to go for other systems to mount by New Year's. We'll see if that happens. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything really major changing. Um, we have a couple design changes in drivetrain. So we have to change the mounting situation for the differential. Um, but that's just moving a couple tubes around. Um, that's essentially all it is, is just moving a couple tubes around. Uh, making a couple things like these, these main roll hoop braces are coming down a little bit to about there so that the, the rear wing mounting is a little bit shorter and stiffer. Um, but suspension is very difficult to design for. Um, it's difficult to validate it before you test it. And we've been able to test our suspension geometry this year. Um, so making a drastic change to the rear box is a little bit, it'd make a lot of people unhappy because uh, you have to redesign suspension and that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, it's difficult to validate. Uh, so as far as like suspension geometry, suspension nodes, which are these four right here, uh, those are all staying the same. I kind of mentioned it earlier. I'd like to point it out again. Like another another like big benefit to using composites to make a monocoque or something like that is suspension has this entire face to mount to if they want to use it. Um, rather than having, you know, this these are pretty much the only four options suspension has in the rear. But in the front, there's an infinite uh, number of mounting points. So someday when we get to full monocoque, suspension will hopefully be very happy. Yeah. Um, you still kind of like, yeah. Uh, I don't know how that would change. Um, but luckily that's, or maybe not very luckily, that's something we, personally don't have to worry about it a whole lot since we're planning on going to EV next year anyway. Um, but I mean, I suppose you could mount it in a different way. Usually teams just have like uh, steel tubes mounted to the monocoque that um, extend out and go to the motor mounting points anyway. Yeah, you can't really, you're basically, you're mounting around the engine because you can't change the mounting points on the engine. I don't really know how to answer the question. Um, <clears throat> but I don't see why not. The only thing that might be beneficial is like, if you can move it down. Um, but that's pretty much, it might actually be worse, but maybe not, we'll see. One day, anything else? Uh, so the overall width uh, right by the main row hoop was within, I think uh, an eighth of an inch from what it is in CAD, which when you think about it is, Pretty good. Um, tolerance is stacked, right? So like you have your exact design in CAD and when you're making something out of composites, you have to make a mold for it and everything. So you have to, basically it's a three-step process for us where we have uh, positive molds 
made out of foam. Uh, and then we make carbon fiber molds on top of those. So already there's some tolerance issues there. And then from those uh, carbon fiber molds, we lay up inside of those to make the monocoque. So there's even more tolerance stacking there. Um, so getting a precise part that's this big out of carbon fiber or any composite, whatever, um, is difficult. Uh, one of my goals this season is to have uh, to hit tighter tolerances and be lower than what we had last year. Basically, that all comes down to like making a good mold. Anything else? The long walk out here. Okay. Well, if that's it, um, thanks for coming. I hope it wasn't too much of a drag. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about what's going on. Uh, hopefully you're interested. Uh, if you're not on Slack, you probably wouldn't be here. Uh, so you can always reach out to me if you have any questions or if you're interested in anything. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming.